Ma'am, I think you should introduce the speaker. Really? Okay. Mm. Maybe I have reduced the volume. Ah, yeah. yeah, is that okay now? Is this okay? Yes, ma'am, we can start. Yeah, no, my, vo my voice is okay or audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Hmm. So, welcome all of you. You all, most of you have been with Instrusen earlier for our archaeology programs mainly and some other programs like Reason and Faith and some of you must have come through that group. And also, of course, my Facebook friends are here. Ancient India. That has been a big thing nowadays. Everywhere we see, we are we were the greatest. We were we had everything. Well, from airplanes to you know philosophy, we had everything. To some extent, some things are true, but the the glorification, the way it goes on now, is 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 not really done thing when it comes to academics. So I spoke to Professor Dr. Shraddha Kumboshkar few a months, uh, I think two months ago, in which she was busy. And I asked her to give a lecture on this topic, whether ancient India was democratic. She is my Facebook friend again. We haven't met uh, exactly, but on Facebook, you know, you you know who is what and who should be approached and who should not be approached. So Shraddha is a professor of history and heads the Department of History in Savitri Bai Pule, Pune University. Of course, she is master's in history and she also has master's in Sanskrit. So, you know, credentials for talking about ancient India, if some people want that. She, she has done her doctorate. Her thesis is entitled, uh, Nationalistic Interpretations of Ancient Indian Texts, Maharashtra, during 1885 to 1929. And her career as a university teacher is spanning over 25 years. Her research interests are ancient and modern Indian history, European intellectual history, that's very interesting, historiography, memory studies, she says, and Dalit studies. I would like to know from you what is memory studies, uh, you know, Shraddha? Maybe some other time. And her research, I mean, she has written copiously for Economic and Political Weekly. Uh, you must have heard of it. It is a very strong, very nerdy magazine. And uh, it, it uh, talks about many socio-political issues, always has been doing that for over the years. She has also written for Marathi publications, newspapers, Samaj Prabodhan Patrika, and her research articles have been published in academic conferences in Europe, as Australia, Far East, and the USA. She has contributed lectures in Virginian University, Houston University, and Groningen University. So, uh, the pandemic has, uh, you know, uh, put us all to work online. And she has also been invited for lectures at Oxford University, Asiatic Society of Bombay, and other places of learning. I, I, I think, uh, Shraddha, they were also online, or did you go there yourself? Shraddha? Uh, no, these were online. Since the online. Yes, online. yes. Before, before that, uh, I mean, I did not know how to operate an online program. But now, since... Uh, Purish, what, since April 20, 2020, right? Yeah, I think since April 2020, we have been doing online academic programs at Institute and Trust. And uh, along with geology, archaeology, other culture, and um, various other topics, we also address to historical issues. And we would like to talk more about it since this is the demand of the day, 
we must know we really must know what is what and what is just empty glorification shraddha i think i'm not going to take much of your time because uh, i don't think uh, even one hour is going to be enough for this topic we are very much likely to go on for more than those uh, allotted 60 minutes i i think uh, already uh, almost 9 minutes to 10 minutes have passed and i give the mic to you welcome shraddha thank you so much for accepting our invitation thank, thank you thank you and it's a pleasure uh, because uh, it's like a promise that has been fulfilled you know uh, because as you rightly pointed out mukda it's been quite some time many many weeks uh, since we've been discussing this and finally uh, uh, opportunity has uh, presented itself uh, for me to share a few thoughts about what i feel uh, about uh, whether uh, ancient india was democratic or not so the title of the presentation which i'll be uh, sharing throughout uh, talk is was ancient india uh, democratic as we all know uh, there have been claims that ancient india has had its share of democracy since a long long time here we can see uh, pandit nehru who wrote his glimpses of world history way back in 1934 and in there <clears throat> he uh, says that there was a kind of democracy in the aryan settlements that is to say the aryan inhabitants could to some extent control the government so uh, we have a illustrious uh, list of people who have made these claims that uh, democracy has its roots in ancient india uh, then comes uh, professor kashi prasad jaiswal who uh, at the height of the indian national movement uh, back in 1943 Uh, writes that uh, from the vedas uh, we find that national life and activities in the earliest times on record were expressed through popular assemblies and institutions so he is talking of popular assemblies and institutionalized ones not sporadic ones um, being present in uh, ancient india during the vedic times uh, he speaks of the samiti and also of the sabha Uh, which is a kind of a recurring theme in the claims that have been made about uh, democracy being present in uh, ancient indian times so jaiswal is a very important kind of a point of departure for us because he is somebody who uh, picks up these two specific uh, nouns from the vedic literature and says that these uh, indeed are um, assemblies kinds of uh, parliament where parleys that is conversations go on about the future of uh, whatever happens to the uh, existing contemporary society in the vedic age um in 2015 ncert came out with a book uh, and the book uh, talks about democratic values and institutions not being purely western it gives a, a decent survey of uh, athenian democracy and the republics and all these things and then it says that uh, democracy and it's a very wise kind of a, a stand that they have taken talking about the essence of democracy wherein there are conversations there are arguments there are contestations and they say that uh, democracy is not something that is only originated in the west but uh, if we just look around uh, there are so many diverse cultures within our society wherein there are lots of dialogues discussions and contestations uh, going on so the ncert book uh, for standard 12 speaks about uh, the book the small booklet i think is uh, entitled the history of uh, democracy or the story of our democracy not history story of our democracy um then we have the chairman of the ugc who wrote a letter uh, last year uh asking various universities to celebrate the constitution day in a uh, unique fashion 
wherein uh, he said uh, that India being a diverse nation, we have so many different religions, all those things. And since uh, we uh, are celebrating the 75 years of our independence, uh, he uh, very uh, rightfully uh, speaks about the credit being given to inclusiveness and diversity of this society. And he says that uh, it's not only uh, the world's largest democracy, but also the mother of democracy. Uh, this is something that is new in the uh, rhetoric that um, has been going on throughout the various uh, formal institutional uh, kinds of uh, dialogues that the government has with people at large and also uh, with uh, the academic institutions and uh, uh, international communities. So uh, this is where uh, the University Grants Commission chairperson uh, takes a stand that uh, not only are we the largest democracy, but we are also the mother of democracy. Um, when we have people of this range claiming that democracy has its origins in ancient India, or it at least existed in ancient India, it becomes important for us as um, people who are interested in history of ideas, people who are interested in history in general, and people who are interested in the uh, institutions of democr uh, democracy. Uh, for us, it becomes really important to uh, try and uh, explore what democracy is all about and then uh, verify whether to have such a claim that ancient India had uh, democracy in it, uh, whether this claim holds true or not. So uh, as academics do, uh, first and foremost, we go to the Encyclopedia Britannica or we go to the Oxford English Dictionary. And here I felt that if we uh, go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, it, will, it gives us a decent um, definition or description of what democracy is. We know that the word comes from the Greek demokrasia, uh, which is a coupling together of demos, that is people, and kratos, that is rule, power, might. Uh, this combination of words of uh, demos and kratos is something uh, that comes up. The, the term itself is coined in the fifth century uh, before common era. Uh, earlier, this used to be known as before Christ. Uh, so the term is derived in the 5th century BCE, but that does not mean that democracy uh, evolved in uh, ancient uh, Greece in the 5th century BCE because democratic institutions of where, uh, wherein people had certain uh, rules, uh, people had certain powers, authorities, uh, they had existed in preceding centuries as well. So uh, we find, for example, people such as Solon, uh, who um, pioneered uh, the idea of having written uh, rules in uh, what is what has come to be known as the Athenian uh, democracy. Um, the city-states uh, and republics in ancient Greece, they had uh, a sovereign body. Many of them had a sovereign body called as Ecclesia. Uh, this was like a committee wherein people met together, they passed laws, they passed decrees, orders. Uh, they also elected officials and heard people who had cer certain things to say or there were certain objections to the laws or decrees. Um, this meant 40 times a year, that's almost on a weekly basis. Uh, and all the males above 18 uh, years of age uh, who had Athenian parents were the uh, citizens, therefore the word citizen is in uh, parenthesis. Uh, all citizens were entitled to attend and vote. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a form of direct democracy wherein people actually physically are present while taking decisions for their uh, society. Um, it is clear that 50% uh, of the population, obviously, the females and uh, third gender people, um, they were excluded from this idea of uh, citizenship. Uh, also, people 
who did not have Athenian parents, that is people who were travelers, people who were slaves, who had been brought from outside of Greece uh, or outside of Athens, these people were also excluded from these rights of voting and attending the ecclesia. So we know that there is some kind of a rule that is in the hands of the people as far as the Athenian democracy is concerned. Uh, but we also know that this is a very, very limited kind of a uh, rule in the hands of the people because the uh, electorate or the, the people who are voting or the citizens uh, as they were called, these themselves are a very limited kind of a population. There are a lot of exclusions. Still, um, there were people such as Pericles who um, was a famous person who kind of inspired people to follow the democratic institutions. Uh, people such as Pericles in the 5th century BCE, they advocated the ideas that form the cluster called as democracy. So while he's praising, this is his famous speech, which he gave a uh, funerary, while he was attending a funeral, he gave this speech, funeral of soldiers who had fallen for protecting their state. So he says that this um, uh, this administration, the system that we have, the administration favors the many instead of the few. So it's not uh, an aristocracy. It's not a uh, rule by a very selected kind of people. There are many, many people who are uh, involved in the administration of our city-state. Uh, he also says that if we look at the laws, we try to afford equal justice to all in their private differences, class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit. So be, uh, be a citizen poor or rich, he says that uh, this is not something that uh, really affects the uh, justice given or meted out to the citizens of Athens. Also, he talks about uh, if a man is able to, uh, uh, nor again does poverty bar the way, if a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. And the freedom which we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. He's talking not only of the political life, but also of the uh, real day-to-day -day life wherein he says that we are free. Um, interestingly, uh, this is a piece that was used for uh, voting people into uh, exile. Piece of uh, a shard of pottery, really. Uh, this used to be called as ostracon. So whenever the assembly had to take some, ecclesia had to take a decision uh, to uh, send somebody into exile, they would write the name of whoever was the person to be exiled and they would uh, write it on this shard called as ostracon. And if uh, enough votes were in favor of uh, sending this person out of the city state, then that person would uh, would be ostracized. Hence, uh, I mean the the word, hence the connection ostracon and ostracizing. Uh, so, uh, this is fine with the Greek city states and the European roots of democracy and all of that. Uh, but coming down to the Indian scenario. Uh, what should be a proper way of thinking as far as the initial question that we started off with uh, is concerned. Now, I think that it's important that we ask ourselves these three questions. What is ancient? What do we mean by ancient? What do we mean by India? And what kind of democracy are we talking of when we are claiming that ancient India was democratic? And in this, I think uh, it will be important for us to remember that ideas and names, uh, they are always fluid. They do not have a stagnant kind of a meaning. So a word which is used, for example, in the Vedic period, will have a different meaning in the, in the Puranic period or in the Gupta period, again, in the contemporary time, so on and so forth. Um, in order for us to just keep this in mind, I felt that this story by Toba 
स्टोरी कॉल्ड तोबा टेक्सिंग बाय सादत हसन मंटो एंड एन एक्सर्ट आउट ऑफ इट वुड बी वेरी रेलेवेंट बिशन सिंह इज अ पर्सन हू इज कंसिडर्ड अ लुनाटिक एंड ही इज इन अ लुनाटिक असाइल एट द टाइम ऑफ द पार्टीशन ऑफ इंडिया मंटो इज डिस्क्राइबिंग वॉट हैपन्स वेन after the partition kind of you know the banks of partition kind of settled down uh, the officials start uh, taking measures to divide the lunatics into people who belong to pakistan and people who belong to hindustan um i think it may not be proper for me to uh, read Uh, the entire thing because uh, but just uh, just to give uh, some idea jab uh, bishan singh ki bari aayi bishan singh is uh, one such person who is considered as a uh, mad person and he is somebody who simply uh, is exasperated he fails to understand what is going on he simply asks where is my village the name of the village is toba take singh where is it whether it is in pakistan or it is in uh, hindustan and the official he is in a jocular mood he says that it is now in pakistan indeed in reality the village has gone into uh, india but the effect that it has on bishan singh he simply uh, pounces off and he says that i am not going to go uh, to the other side goes and joins his friends and uh, simply refuses uh, to go over to the other side and the absurdity of it all uh, is uh, underlined by monto uh, when he says that uh, when he describes the kind of argument that to, uh, bishan singh tries to make it's a complete uh, blabber really ji pad de gid gid de ex de bedhana de mood de dal of toba texing and pakistan so he just trying to imitate some words which he must have heard um, when the officials are speaking with each other in english trying to just make an argument which indeed is uh, completely uh, nonsensical uh, to the uh, officials but it also is nonsensical probably for himself and as it is he's been branded as a a uh, lunatic person so the absurdity of it all i think underlines uh, the point from where we uh, started off uh, what do we mean uh, when we say that there is this idea of india of a land idea of democracy so uh, the the signifiers and signified the names that we use for certain concepts and the uh, ideas within those names that are contained in those names uh, they hardly ever uh, hold on for a long long time they keep on transforming themselves they are always fluid um when we talk of the word ancient we know that in france ancient regime ancien regime it's the period just before the french revolution that is just before 1789 so they are talking of the um early 18th century 17th century 16th century also uh, as if uh, you know they they are calling it the old regime the ancient regime so for them 16th 17th 18th centuries are ancient old period when we talk of india the word ancient uh, is it broadly indicates the period between the uh, rigveda that is around 15th century i'm saying around around a lot in these because the dates are never uh, fixed that is another fluidity that really we have to uh, negotiate with uh, because uh, we don't have precise dates when we are talking of any uh, ancient period happenings or uh, phenomena very very rarely we will have corroborations from different source materials to fix the dates uh, so uh, rugveda uh, which uh, uh, got compiled uh, around 15th century bce and the end of the gupta period that is in the 6th century of common era that is 6th century what we call ad huh. so uh, for us when we talk 
uh, in Indian academia of the ancient period, we talk of the span of 15 in the negative and six in the positive. So about uh, 2,100 years uh, when we are describing the ancient period. Naturally, it is not very useful to talk about the ancient period as if it's a fixture. Remember that we are living in the 21st century and what was happening in the 1st century AD. So from the 1st century AD till 21st century AD, so many, so many things have changed that obviously even for the ancient period, uh, not at such a great pace perhaps, but definitely there were many, many changes and it's just not useful for us to simply say that certain things were happening in the ancient period. So one has to be more specific when one makes claims about periodization. Also, we uh, have to face what is called as the James Mill kind of periodization in Indian history. Uh, what he called, uh, I mean, he, he gave these names which are very, very unfair, absurd and quite meaningless, but they have become popular and uh, many historians still uh, like to use uh, these names. More than historians, there are people uh, who uh, use historical terminologies or um, terms and concepts from history. Uh, even if they are not historians, they adhere to this uh, kind of periodization given by James Mill, wherein he says that there is a period of Indian history called as the Hindu period, then the Muslim period, and the British period. And this is so, so, so incorrect um, that one cannot really begin to uh, talk about the inconsistencies and the you know, general uh, wrongness of it all. But still, uh, we know that Hinduism as a religion is something uh, that uh, has evolved over many centuries and the time period that Mill has in mind, uh, that really did not have a religion called as Hinduism. So this is a period where in Sanatana Dharma, or there were many other names that were given, but not uh, Hindu. So it's really, uh, it's really not understandable for any uh, good uh, scholar of history, why he names it as Hindu period. Uh, also, what he calls the Muslim period, it's not a period when uh, all Muslims are uh, the rulers, uh, if he intends to uh, make that claim. Uh, because we know that there are Sultanate and Mughals ruling in uh, central and northern parts of India, but there are many other uh, kingdoms and there are many other uh, rulers who are ruling at different places in different times. And these are not necessarily rulers who belong to the Muslim faith. One, also, um, we know that these rules uh, of the Sultanate period and the Mughal period uh, were not theocratic rules. They were not. Uh, they were not uh, rules. Uh, they were not uh, rulers who followed the uh, religious line uh, in total. So, at, in certain um, areas, yes, uh, the consultation of religious authorities was taken, but not everywhere, obviously. And hence, uh, the periodization is problematic. Uh, the British period, okay, fair enough, but again, uh, there also we have the princely states and all those things, but be that as it may. Um, uh, as far as the time period that uh, Mill is talking about is concerned, um, he considers the ancient period, what he calls the Hindu period, to go on till the 11th century, uh, even if you know uh, land grants and feudal ideas such as loyalty chains and those kind of things were becoming popular from the 5th century onwards itself. So why, why do uh, historians in the second para of the presentations, why do historians agree that ancient period uh, ends around the 6th century CE and the medieval period begins? Because medievalism is a way of thinking. It's a way wherein uh, there are different ideas as against the ancient period, which start becoming very, very popular ideas such as having a chain of loyalty, uh, parceling out of land in terms of uh, you know land grants and stuff, uh, and the um, one sabdari uh, ideas of military 
the chain of loyalty really. So um, when we say something is And we also have to be careful that even if we are talking about the uh, correct kind of a time period, uh, still uh, it's a very uh, broad period of more than 2000 years. Then the fluidity of the uh, name of India, uh, not to go into the debate of, uh, you know, whether it is the Indus River and those things. Uh, let me just uh, stick to uh, some of the uh, uh, specific mentions uh, wherein uh, the idea of India being uh, being physically uh, located in a specific region has been expressed. Uh, Rugveda, uh, the first mandala has a sukta, uh, the first part of uh, Rugveda has a sukta, wherein uh, it talks of uh, the word called as Sapta Sindhu, that is Sindhu, as in it's it's any uh, kind of a large water body. So the word Sindhu again will be used for many, many different things. It will be used for a river, it will be used for uh, sea, uh, so on and so forth. It will be used sometimes for a large water body also. But here uh, we have a concept uh, wherein the location or the physical uh, attributes of the land of India are described in the uh, Rig Veda. Uh, then we have uh, Megasthenes, uh, who is uh, an ambassador uh, uh, staying in Pataliputra, Patna, uh, wherein he speaks of the Himalaya mountains. He calls them Himudas, but these are Himavat, that is Himalaya mountains on the north. Uh, he says that India is rhomboid in its shape, four sides, two seas on the east and the south side and the river Indus on the western boundary. So he's talking of what we may today call the uh, uh, northern parts of north and central parts of uh, today's India. Um, you move on to the Gupta period and the classical Sanskrit poet Kalidasa. Uh, he uh, has a different uh, geography in his mind. His cognitive geography goes into the Deccan Plateau, wherein he is. Uh, he describes the beautiful landscape of uh, uh, while the yaksha is uh, forced to send a message to his beloved through the cloud. Uh, so the idea of where India is and what constitutes India is also something that is very very uh, fluid. Uh, then when we come to the idea of democracy, uh, we have to uh, remember that there are, uh, first and foremost, of course, there are two kinds of democracy. One is direct democracy, the example of which we saw in Athenian democracy, and the other is a representative democracy. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, what is the definition according to the Oxford English uh, Dictionary? Uh, it says that democracy uh, means fair and equal treatment of everyone in an organization, etc. And um, the right to take part in making decisions, the right. So it talks of somebody giving fair and equal treatment to everybody and the right of everybody to take part in decision making. Obviously, it flows from this very definition that democracy is not only about a political system. This is something that is present in our day-to-day -day relations between various individuals. It's something that is uh, present in institutions and in processes as well. So the question arises whether ancient India did give fair and equal treatment to all as is expected from the definition of democracy and did everyone actually participate in decision making. Certain uh, source materials have been consulted uh, for this lecture, wherein uh, suktas from Rigveda and Atharva Veda have been uh, consulted, uh, which talk of uh, what earlier we have seen K.P. Jaiswal uh, has mentioned Sabha and Samiti. Jaiswal calls them uh, 
houses of parliament, wherein uh, not exactly you know, in the English democracy sense of the term, but he says that Sabha and Samiti, uh, Sabha is a more of a, a, a social and political meeting place. And he says Samiti is more of an elite kind of a place where knowledgeable people would come together and discuss uh, the future of their society. Uh, this is K.P. Jaiswal uh, drawing his own conclusions based on uh, the source materials that uh, we will be taking a look at. Um, the seventh bundle of Atharvaveda uh, has this sutta wherein um, Sabha and Samiti are praised uh, as if they are the daughters of Prajapati and uh, these two knowledgeable daughters, uh, they should protect me, they should avatam they should protect me. That is the prayer uh, made by uh, this person who is the composer of the poem. Uh, also in Atharva Veda, uh, we have uh, another sukta wherein uh, the person desires that his presentation in the Samiti, his presentation in front of this whole assembly of people uh, should be um, very good. It should carry some weight. So he, should, he says that I should be able to speak fluently uh, in all these different scenarios, but of course, the assemblies, samitayaha, teshu, charu, vadami, aham. In the samitis, I should be able to speak in a charu, in a, a graceful fashion. Um, we also have um, this um, sukta from the third uh, mandal of Atharvaveda, wherein uh, the king is... Uh, requested by the rishi by the person who is uh, who's uh, composing the uh, sukta he says that if there are any people if there are any naysayers if there are any doubters of your influence then even if they belong to your same clan king you should banish them away into exile you should banish them away into exile now the uh, other example that I found very interesting from uh, Atharva Veda, uh, it talks of, and this is a celebrated sutta because uh, it talks of, uh, you know, the title itself given by Satavalikar to the translation is uh, that this is a sutta about the choice of king. Tvam Visho Vrunata. Vruna is uh, to choose. Hmm. Uh, when Swayam Vara, uh, we have uh, wherein the same verb is used, Prun. Uh, so, this Sukta is celebrated uh, by people uh, saying that this is something wherein the Visha, that is the general public, is supposed to choose the king. And hence, this is something that talks of democratic roots uh, in ancient India. Uh, also, it has mention of the word Rashtra, Atvagan Rashtram Sahavashtra. So, so on and so forth. Uh, what is the idea behind this concept of Rashtra and what is it uh, uh, that is being described in the second stanza? Uh, first and foremost, the very word Rashtra, and here again, I want us to remember this idea that names are fluid. Today, when we say Rashtra, we have the nation in our mind. Uh, but when we say Maharashtra, it's not a nation. It is just a big, big region uh, that we are talking of. Similarly, here in the Sukta of Atharvaveda, when one is talking about the Rashtra, they are simply talking about a sphere of influence. Remember the word, the root Raj, huh? that is the, a king who who's somebody who kind of graces the place he is somebody who is a uh, person who rules. Similarly, Rashtra is the area wherein the influence of an authority is exerted. So, Rashtra can be a group of villages, it can be a group of um, regions, and it can, as today, it can also mean a nation state as large as India or any other nation state in the world. Uh, we have to remember that here in the Atharva Veda, obviously, they do not have 
a huge rashtra the way we have in our mind, but they are talking of a smaller uh, unit uh, of perhaps a few villages coming together. Um, uh, the Sukta talks of the region which has been Atvagan, the region has come to you. Uh, that means it has come under your influence. The region has been acquired by you. And uh, may the people and deities accept your rule. They are not talking of, I mean, the Sukta is not talking of uh, Vru, uh, Vrunu, Vrunatam, that is uh, the king being elected. But they are saying that may the people and the deities the Pancha Devi and Pradishaha and all those people, Visham that is, Visho that is the uh, subjects, uh, they should accept you in this kingdom, in the Rajya. Also, it talks of let your family be of one record, uh, of one accord, that is Sumana Sahabhavan to all your Kutraha Jaya, your wife and children. They should uh, think along the lines that you are thinking. So there should not be any discord within your family. And it says, oh, powerful, distribute the riches to us. That is the whole point of uh, uh, this prayer to the king that Tatona uh, Ugro Vibhaja Vasuni. This is a uh, repeating stanza, as you can see uh, in this sutta. Tatona Ugro Vibhaja Vasuni. So you be powerful, you be Ugra, and vibhaja, vibhajana, that is uh, divide, vasuni, that is the riches to, that is uh, amongst us. That is the king should not hoard the riches, but the king should distribute the riches among the people. Now, such a sukta being construed as being understood as something wherein uh, the subjects are electing the king is definitely going a bit further than what is actually intended in the sukta. Going back, uh, uh, the earlier uh, sukta that we saw, uh, wherein uh, the king is being advised that he should not listen to people who are going against his influence. Talking of democracy, talking of accepting, talking of argumentation, contestations, this definitely is not something that this person who is a composer of this sukta has in mind. So he is saying that banish away all your uh, opponents. That is the uh, that is the advice that is being given to this particular king. I am not saying this is a general policy, but this is definitely an advice that goes against the idea of discussions, participation, equality of rights, so on and so forth. And then um, these two uh, suktas that we uh, uh, discussed earlier, wherein Sabha and Samiti have been uh, praised, Sabha and Samiti, um, the, the speaker or the composer of the sukta is uh, saying that I should be able to hold the assembly in my, uh, you know, uh, control kind of, uh, and I should be able to carry away the sabha, uh, not, not sabha, the samiti with my argument. Uh, here again, uh, it's, uh, one can say that this is something about participatory uh, decision making, but it does not give us a clear indication as to who are the members of this samiti or sabha and what is the constituent uh, uh, population. Earlier when we were talking of the Athenian democracy, we know that everybody who is above 18, male, with Athenian parents, they are the quote-unquote citizens of this specific uh, democracy in Athens. But here, uh, for lack of evidence or uh, for various other reasons probably, but we do not really have enough information. And when we do not have information and still we make claims, uh, any good historian will agree that these claims are just tall claims. So we do not know whether this Sabha and Samiti are uh, really popular assembly or uh, they are uh, assembly that has only elders or only wise people in it. Uh, these are uh, wild guesses. Uh, which are as good as any other. But still, K.P. Jaiswal, while 
we should also be sympathetic to uh, his erudition and uh, his his uh, emotions uh, when he was writing the book we know that he was writing at the height of this whole 1942 movement wherein it was very important for him to assert that we are capable of ruling ourselves so uh, one can understand but one cannot really agree with what jaiswal uh, talks about okay then um, here is another sukta uh, from the atharva veda <coughs> wherein uh, this is again a very very celebrated kind of sutta which talks of um, we should be together speak together know each other's minds um, our discussions uh, be in tandem with each other's minds uh, but we also have in atharva veda another uh, sutta uh, wherein <clears throat> a person is being given a shaper he is being cursed hmm? what is the crime that this person has uh, committed uh, a person that is a king who confiscates a brahmana's property so wo betide kind of a, a sharp curse is being thrown off to him uh, what will be the worst uh, case scenario for a person who confiscates the brahmana's property uh, uh, it says that his samiti will not agree with him his his meeting the consultative body or whatever the the, the assembly in which he sits some iti the etymology just simply tells us that some is together and iti is uh, being together going together sitting together all these different shades of meaning so some iti is uh, wherein people sit together it's like a meeting in hindi we have a nice word for it baithak so we sit together Uh, so samiti uh, does not agree with him that is the uh, horrible thing a misfortune that will come upon a person who uh, confiscates a brahmana's property so uh, uh, this is something wherein one uh, can guess that uh, this must have been happening uh, quite frequently for people to be afraid of the samiti not agreeing with somebody uh this in fact goes in favor of the argument that samiti uh, had the uh, authority samiti had the uh, capacity to negate the decisions of whoever was the leader perhaps the king perhaps the uh, leader of the gana uh, but uh, this is something that goes on the uh, other side of the argument and i don't want to be unfair and just give you know cherry pick my evidence to say that um, samitis are not really democratic bodies here is here is an evidence which says that samiti can go against uh, a person who is leading now with all these uh, evidences from vedic literature and i have not even entered the realm of buddhist literature uh, which talks of the uh, discussion is going on within the sangha uh, and uh, discussions going on within the group of the uh, ascetics uh, uh, i have kind of uh, stopped at the uh, vedic the claims of uh, democracy in vedic uh, literature uh, primarily because the claims that have been made are based on uh, they they make a lot of use of sabha samiti and such other uh, materials there now altekar as altekar is a very well known name and he wrote about the state uh, in ancient india uh, wherein he uh, makes an argument uh, that uh, tries to uh, contest the claims made by uh, kp jais altekar is writing in 1949 this is also the period when the constituent assembly is already uh sitting and they are uh, they are you know discussing and trying to frame the indian constitution so this is uh, one has to be aware of the time period also when the book is being written and book is getting published um altekar talks of uh, a very very raw nerve he touches very raw nerve of the indian social milieu and that is the caste system he says that the whatever was the polity in even if we call it hindu india um, this polity had to work in a society which 
accepted the caste system. And the caste system, we know that uh, it's a system which discriminates. It completely uh, discriminates. So franchise, the ability to exercise your vote in the ancient Indian, even if we are talking of the little republics, Mahajanapadas, and uh, they have been called as uh, Paura Janapada regions. Even if we are talking of these Indian republics, the caste system is something that completely goes against the very uh, spirit democratic governance because obviously it's an exclusionary and discriminatory and unfair kind of a system. So uh, Artekar himself is accepting that therefore a franchise could not be uh, extended to, to the full population. He also states, and this is very important, that in the modern age, which does not believe in the predetermination of one's function by birth, this naturally will not work and we will have to extend the franchise to all citizens of this country. Jaiswal, for all his uh, nationalistic fervor, uh, is a person who in the concluding paragraph has his moment of you know, fairness and he talks of a very, um, uh, a very pertinent um, point. He says that this whole idea, even if I am talking, I am means even if Jaiswal himself is talking of uh, India having all these great uh, bodies of parliament and sabha and samiti and all those things, uh, he says that social advancement is not something that is a monopoly of a particular race. So he is conceding that it's not only India, it's not only the Hindu polity which has evolved uh, such grand. Um, ideas and concepts and institutions. Uh, and he is very candid about it. He, he says, I'm, a, I'm not a believer in the chief wisdom wherein people preach that political greatness is inherent. You know, we are like that only kind of a rhetoric. Uh, it's a superstition which is as baseless as the Spanish superstition of the blue blood. So he is deeply aware uh, that you cannot say that we are the chosen people. You cannot say that we really, uh, you know, such motherhood statements really uh, are laughable in the sense that concepts and ideas evolve at different places in different times. And sometimes at the same time, they evolve in different places. Like, for example, the wheel. Uh, I'm sure it was invented at many places at many different uh, times. And there is no need to assume uh, or there is no need to believe in this theory of diffusionism that all the great things have one origin and from there they have diffused into the world outside. Uh, this is not something uh, that makes uh, sense if we rely on historical source materials. So he says that there is no such thing as blue blood in evolution of uh, again the word is very very important. He is talking of evolution. He is not saying that there is a birth. Huh? It's not something that happens at a particular time. It's a process that goes on to evolve over a period of time, over various societies, so on and so forth. And then he comes back to his position and says that even if such blue blood be a reality, it is certainly present in the veins of a Hindu, thereby asserting Writing in 1924, Jaiswal, what choice did he really have when the whole British administration, uh, the whole world was bent on saying that uh, India, you know, Indians are incapable of ruling themselves, they are not martial enough, all those kinds of ideas being, uh, you know, attacking uh, the, uh, the core of being Indian, naturally such uh, rhetoric or polemical points were bound to uh, come up in the writings of people who were at the same time anti-colonial, national, and also uh, who wanted uh, to invent a glorious tradition for their nation. Then, uh, coming back to Nehru, where we started, Nehru, remember, uh, he said that uh, one can find uh, that there was a kind of democracy in ancient India. Uh, he goes on to say, this sentence is immediately in the following pages qualified. Uh, 
uh, wherein he says that we should remember that this democracy was confined to the Aryans themselves. Here again, we have to discount that even if he is using the terminology of Aryans, and today we know that, that there is no such people as Aryans, there are Vedic people, but still, whatever, for his all his you know, knowledge in 1930s, uh, he says that uh, democracy is not uh, something which has had universal application in the ancient times. It was definitely a very restricted kind of democracy, wherein the slaves the people belonging to the low castes, and here I am rem uh, reminded of the um, fantastic, not fantastic, it's a very realistic and erudite work by uh, Chanana, wherein he talks of slavery in ancient India. Uh, it has been translated into Marathi by uh, Ganesh Thite. Beautiful book, uh, completely gives us a detailed account of how slavery was systematically uh, prevalent and uh, very much in vogue in ancient India. But coming back to Nehru, he concedes, he qualifies his statement saying that slaves and uh, the people from the lower castes, uh, supposedly in those days, they were supposed to be in, at a lower stature. Uh, they had no democracy or freedom. So Nehru is also not having any uh, fancy dreams about democracy. Coming to the 19th century, we have in Mahatma Phule a very, very, very um, forthright kind of a thinker who speaks in the language of the people, but who also poses very searching kind of questions in front of uh, the people who care to listen to him. Here, when he's talking, he's writing uh, in a book called as Sarvajanik Satya Dharma. This is post the uh, establishment of the Indian National Congress. Uh, the book was published in 1891, but he wrote it in uh, 1890s, uh, 1890 and 1889. Uh, Fule poses this question wherein he says that unless all the various strata of our society, including the people who have been banished into the um, hills, the bill people, the coalies, unless and until all these people obtain education, then they become worthy of having this, these, you know, carrying out all these intellectual discussions. How can we say uh, that we are together as a nation? He uses a very eloquent term in Marathi, ekamaya lok. He says, how can we have this lok, that is the world which is united uh, in one, and aren't national Congress is quite useless, he says, till such a time comes. So the claims of representation made by bodies such as the Indian National Congress were also contested. And this is a very democratic kind of a manifestation, articulation, I think, that such claims were in the 1890s itself contested by people such as Mahatma Phule. Um, so the question, uh, yeah, before that. Now, what does Dr. Ambedkar have to say about democracy? What, what did he write? This is a speech that he gave to uh, on the Voice of America radio uh, in 1956, wherein he's, he takes stock of all these people who have written, Jaiswal and all those people, wherein uh, he says that there are two major things uh, which are claimed as being the, uh, being the roots of democracy in ancient India. But he says that this these two things, one is a republic and second is the parliamentary government. So he's talking of the two uh, kinds of political systems that have been uh, so celebrated in the writings of people such as Jaiswal and also uh, to some extent uh, Arteka. Uh, these people have said that in India there, there are uh, two things that are coexisting. One is monarchies with all the Mauryas and Guptas and all those various people uh, becoming monarchs over large uh, areas of mainland India. And uh, there are certain other areas wherein we have smaller republics 
such as the 16 Mahajanapadas and many other such uh, republics uh, which find mention in the Vedas. That is the, uh, and hence we uh, have democracy in ancient India. That is the claim that was made by Jaiswal and also to a certain extent by Arthika. Ambedkar goes a step further and he says that democracy as an idea is quite different from a republic as well as from a parliamentary government. These two things do not combine together, uh, give us a cause to celebrate that we had democracy. Roots of democracy, he says, lie not in the form of government, parliamentary or otherwise, but it's more than a form of government. It's primarily a mode of associated living. It's a community feeling. These are to be searched in the social relationships, in terms of associated life between people who form any given society. So how are people treating each other? How are people interacting with each other? That is something that is very important uh, as per Dr. Ambedkar. And he says that these uh, little uh, islands of excellence, as it were, uh, of having this republic and that monarchy or this uh, little assembly of discussions, uh, uh, these do not uh, really apply to the entire social milieu of the ancient period. That is the argument that Dr. Ambedkar has made. <clears throat> so what can we say about whether ancient India was democratic or not? I've highlighted three or four words. Some earlier version and direct democracy. Remember, there are two kinds of democracy. One is direct democracy, wherein people actually physically have to be present, and then the representative democracy. So what we can infer based on the various source materials that we have is definitely that some parts of ancient India did enjoy an earlier version of proto-democracy, uh, which was a direct democracy. This coexisted with monarchy in other parts. That much we can definitely say as far as Indian history is concerned, an earlier version of direct democracy in some parts of ancient India. Then what about the representative democracy? This in the modern sense obviously requires modern means of communication. So in order for somebody to elect your representatives, then all these representatives to go together and meet at a particular place on a particular day, all these things require a modern means of communication, also a modern value system for it to be re truly representative. And it would be simply anachronistic. It goes against the ethos of zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, uh, to imagine that in any ancient region, this kind of representative democracy could have existed. I'm talking not only of India, but any ancient region where representative democracy in the modern sense of the term with modern kind of representation being given to um, being given equally to all uh, citizens of a particular nation state or a, a region uh, this kind of a, a representative democracy could not have existed anywhere in the ancient time simply because of the material uh, support that it requires one material as in, in terms of communication, transport, all these things. Also, because the modern value system would not have existed. Otherwise, that, that period would have been called as a modern period. Simply, The modern value system with all its specialization, rationality, uh, ideas of you know equal, equality, liberty, fraternity, all those things. Uh, it is something that is simply modern. One cannot really superimpose it, how much ever one may wish to, one cannot superimpose it on the ancient uh, time period. So why do people make such claims? These are some of the points that I feel are the possible reasons why such claims are made. First and foremost, of course, the contemporary choice of the political system. One wants legitimacy, like for example, Nehru speaking about democracy being uh, present in ancient period. Uh, he probably wanted to say that, okay, we are going to have this kind of a system and it's not something new, please don't be afraid. We had it earlier in the ancient times. 
Secondly, one can find justification uh, for the present by going back to the past. One can say, okay, we have accepted this kind of a system and it is only correct that we have accepted it because our forefathers have already had it once upon a time, finding justification. Thirdly, what uh, has come to be uh, known as the therapeutic use of history. History as therapy. It nurses certain insults that we face. It nurses certain injuries that the na national mind has uh, had to uh, has had to, uh, yeah, probably what is the right word for it? Yeah, we've had to uh, take those injuries. The colonial, the orientalist insults that we were incapable of ruling ourselves. The earlier uh, earlier argument that I also made about the uh, Indians not being martial enough, the martial race theory. So uh, inventing democratic traditions in ancient India, this invention of a tradition of democracy is something that acted as a therapy for the insults that Indians had to endure in the um, 1930s and 40s. And hence we find people such as uh, Jaiswal and Artekar writing about uh, having uh, glorious tradition of democracy in the ancient week. Um, we also know that sometimes it is convenient for the powers that be to manufacture certain memories. And here, Mukda, perhaps my uh, memory studies part uh, comes to my rescue when one thinks about uh, why people want to create manufacture memories. Um, Manufacturing memories of a glorious past have their own, uh, they, you know, it has its own um, advantages uh, in the sense that people um, forget the oppressive present around them. And this is not something that I have argued. Uh, Professor Chandra's book called as The Oppressive Present talks of uh, this very process going on in the 19th century as well. So uh, manufacturing of memories of a glorious past, it has its advantages in the sense that it uh, helps you uh, take away your attention from what is happening around you and uh, it creates a memory of a glorious past. Also, it creates a sense, obviously a false sense of ownership of ideas about whose existence doubts are raised. So the moment somebody starts questioning whether you have democracy or not, that is the moment when people start inventing these traditions of glorious democracy having been present in India since 3000 years, 4000 years, and perhaps I don't know what claims will be made ahead. But uh, it's quite absurd to think that ideas can be owned by any society or individuals or nations, because ideas are obviously uh, they are ephemeral, they are not physical or spiritual and nobody can catch on to them. So uh, to imagine that somebody is a progenitor, somebody is a mother of an idea such as democracy, obviously it has its own uh, limitations and it, it becomes uh, almost laughable when somebody makes such claims uh, and it is quite obvious also that when such claims are made, uh, we know that there is a challenge that has been posed to the very existence of that idea. And hence, this is a uh, polemical response being given to that challenge. So what if we believe in these claims? We are living in the post-truth society after all. So what happens if we, you know, it just gives you a nice feeling, warm feeling that you know, we have invented democracy. Uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, history is all about uh, what we are and how we have become what we have become. So history uh, is something that uh, teaches us to know uh, these processes of our becoming in a as much as factual fashion. And this very sense of history gets distorted if we believe in such claims. Uh, Cognitive dissonance is a much discussed term, so I won't uh, go into the details, but people simply start believing in things that are untrue. That is something which is dangerous to uh, any society. 
and uh, as discussed earlier uh, if we believe in the claims then they take our attention away from things that we can actually say so what can we actually celebrate here is a big list of things that we have as a nation actually managed to achieve we've had a sustained democracy we've had fair elections throughout the 75 odd years uh, we've moved away from uh, being an illiterate nation to uh, having a fantastic a great uh, percentage of literacy in our population the life expectancy has increased eradicated many diseases great debt pay uh, payment record with good credit rating is there and uh, all in all in the international politics we have a good standing so why can't we be rightfully proud of these things the answers are to be sought by us and perhaps the words of buddha may uh, come to our rescue wherein he says that be like an island you know and uh, seek the answers only within yourselves and do not fall prey to do not go and prostrate before anybody else atta dipa bhavata become like a dvipa and atta sarana go sharana take refuge in only your own intellect rationality ananya sarana do not take refuge in what other people are telling thank you thank you shraddha some questions are coming they have already started coming in uh, the first question is by vilas gavri he says dr ambedkar can you read it dr ambedkar 